All right, we are recording, and I'm hoping that you guys got a chance to work on the exam from last semester, because you know, the more you work on this before today, the more you're going to absorb you know, the material from today. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about the exam. All right, so starting from the beginning, um, you know, make sure that you write down your student ID. Um, your last name, first name, you know, is not as important to get your student ID right, okay? And try to write it in a legible way, okay? Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, it can be me, totally, but sometimes the seven and the ones, the two and the fives, and so on and so forth, they can be a little bit hard to read. So I would just try to write it as legible, as legibly as possible. Okay, so I think that's relatively legible, okay? Um, it's again, again, your last name, first name is probably not as important. And at some point, you know, I might not even need people to write down their last name and first name because I don't want to know who I'm grading. Yes? It is being recorded right now. Yep. That's a good question to ask. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go through, you know, the uh, usual stuff, you know, like the date and the time obviously would not be the same. This is from last semester. Uh, the exam is an individual exam specific to the student with the ID, blah, 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 and so on. It's basically just saying that, you know, there's no collaboration involved in this particular exam. Next one, paper-based content that was prepared prior to the exam can be used as long as no interaction or collaboration is involved in the attempt to answer questions of the exam. Yep. Um, I think that was in the announcement. It's next Tuesday, so one week from today. Yep. Um, the next one is, do not share or discuss any part of this exam with anyone in class or otherwise unless the next class, until the next class meeting or otherwise permitted by the instructor. Because, you know, sometimes you know, we have people with legitimate excuses of not being able to take the exam on that day, and I don't want people to talk about the exam you know, before everybody has taken the exam. <clears throat> Grading is based on the explanations and steps, blah, 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 and so on. So that part depends on the question itself, okay? So that may not be true for every single question. So you have to read the questions carefully to find out what I'm looking for in terms of, you know, grading the exam or that particular question. Uh, write your answer on your own answer sheets. You know, that may change, okay? I may give you the actual um, space to write down the answer. I haven't really decided yet, okay? So um, the next page, you know, so the finger thing, you know, the little hand, you know, is basically where the uh, page, of, I mean, uh, when I flip the page, you know, that's where the boundary is. So to continue the discussion, you know, I have to say, you know, here, write your answer on your own answer sheets. So bring extra pieces of paper anyway, just in case you need it. Um, I have been to, okay, I've been, I have proctored exams when people ask me, do you have a pencil? So make sure you bring your writing instruments and bring spare ones, you know, just in case, okay? So you don't want to bring only one single pencil and only to find out that it's not working when you have the exam. <clears throat> Um, and then there's a bunch of symbol, you know, uh, explanation. So, and that's, you know, given in the exam in this particular case. All questions carry equal weight, okay? So I tend to, I intend to keep that because that makes it easier for you to prioritize which question to answer first. <clears throat> so what is the strategy? Do you guys know the strategy of answering questions when you have multiple questions and they all carry equal weight? How do you evaluate? Yes. Yep, and time yourself too. So if you know ahead of time the number of questions, you'll make sure that you have enough time to get to get through all of the questions. And if you have time left, then you can go back to the one where you kind of get a little bit, you know, stumbled on. Okay. So those are general strategies for taking exams, not you know, specific to this class, but it's good to know. All right. So we are moving on. Uh, question number one. Uh, is about binary subtraction in this case. So make sure you read the question carefully 
because you know your exam is going to be different from this exam okay so depending on how lazy I plan to be it can be very different which is actually advantageous to you or it can be confusingly similar which is not to your advantage because it means you know things look almost exactly the same but tech makes some minor subtle changes somewhere okay so don't assume that your answer, your questions are the same as this particular exam. Under no circumstances, <laughs> make that assumption. Yes. So question. Sorry. Question. Yeah, that's what we're going to do today. All right. So uh, and it explains right here. Okay, I'm just using my little pointer here. So each step should be cons each step should consist of the following components. You can use, you know, you can write out because, you can write out, you know, therefore, or you can use the mathematical symbols. In other words, you know, just try your best, you know, to minimize the amount of writing, you know, because, you know, that takes time. But for every single step, I need to understand why you come to a particular conclusion, okay? So I need to know why that is the case. Um, in this case, I even spell out all the rules that are applicable. So if you, under, if you have been studying a little bit, you can see that you know, Q of i is the exclusive or between x and x i and y i. That's something that we have talked about already. Um, D of i, which is the difference, is the exclusive or between the Q and the T. We talked about that too. And then T of i plus one is the conjunction of the negation of x i and y i or the negation of Q i and T i that we have talked about as well. So, but don't count on it, okay? In other words, you know, bring your notes, okay? Do not count on the fact that I will give you the definitions or the equations that you need because, you know, it is your test. I'm, you know, I, I, it's open book and open notes, so I'm, I'm assuming that you will also bring your material so that, you know, you know the definitions and whatnot. Are we okay with that? All right, so the key is you already know this is open book, open notes from week one of this entire semester, from the very beginning of this semester. So you should have been working on your study guide along the way all these weeks. So by now, all you really need to do is to clean up your notes a little bit, maybe type it up so that it looks nice, okay? Print it out on a piece of paper or multiple pages of paper. I don't care how many pages of paper you're gonna bring with you. Is yours, okay? You know, as long as it's on paper, it's either handwritten or printed, it's fine. All right. So uh, there are some examples. This is just for the formatting. So in this case, you know, the format is because blah 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 is one, and because we have definition B, then we conclude that is the case. Now, does that make any sense? No, it's not supposed to. This is just showing you the format of the answer. It is not about the meaning of the actual answer. Is that okay? So for every item that you work out, I need to know what makes you think that, okay? What known facts are you using? Which rule are you using? And also, what is the conclusion? Do we have any questions about the format of the answer? Yes. You should not be guessing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So, are we ready to actually work on the question? So the question is right here. In a two-bit you know, subtractor, we know the following. And let me look at the next page. Yeah, so that's it, okay? So we only know those three particular things. Uh, we only know that T1 is a one. We know D0 is a zero. We know Q0 is a one. And we want to work out all of the other bits in the two-bit subtractor. So this is a two-bit subtractor, which means we have bit zero, and we also have bit one. So I want to work out everything based on what is given here. All right, so I'm going to copy this to, wait, okay, so let me, oh, okay, I take it back, sorry. This is my bad. 
So what we are given with are these items here. So we know five bits, not three. So we know T1 is a one, D0 is a zero, Q0 is a one, T2 is a one, and then Y1 is a zero. Those, that's what we know, that's what we are given with. We need to work out every other bit in the two-bit subtractor. I think there's enough space for me to work on it here. So at least you know, I can write out the table. So we got bit zero, bit one. We have the five rows in subtraction. So they are X, Y, Q, T, and D. So I'm just writing out the format here. Okay, so we have subtraction here, subtraction here. So in these cases, do not assume T0 is a zero. Okay, T0 is, can be an unknown bit. Like in this case, T0 is yet to be com computed. We don't know what it is. Do not assume T0 or K0 is a zero. It is just an input. So now I'm gonna uh, fill up <clears throat> this table as much as I can based on the five bits that are given. So we know T1 is a one, so T1 goes here. D0 is a zero, it goes here. Q0 is a one, it goes here. T2 is a one, it goes here. And Y1 is a zero, and it goes here. There we go. So that's what we have at this point, and I need to figure out the rest. All of the other empty spaces, I need to figure out those bits. So let me use question marks you know, to, so that you know, you know what unknowns we're dealing with. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six unknowns, and we need to figure out those particular items. Um, okay, so in terms of grading, it's broken into two big parts. What the first part is 80%, and then the second part is 20%. The, the first part, which is kind of big, is broken up into three subparts. 30% goes to the correct ordering of the deduction. 30% goes to the deduction of the constraints that do not resolve actual values, but limit possibilities, which means, oh, okay, if this is here, then we cannot have that over there, okay? So it doesn't really just give you the answer, but it helps to restrict what can be the answer. And then three is the application of the constraints and definitions to actually deduce the value bit, okay? The bit, the bit value that we are looking for. All right, so, <clears throat> so the question is, how do we proceed from here? Yes? It's already given to you. Okay, let, let, let me highlight here why I said it is already given to you. That term, that, that one term tells you what base we are working with. Because what is a bit? It is a binary digit. So that is to already telling you that we're dealing with base two. The other clue that we're dealing with base two is actually in rules A, B, and C, because they are Boolean operations. In this case, there's no confusion whether it's Boolean or not, because exclusive or does not exist in other bases. It only exists in base two in Boolean um, you know, algebra. All right, so knowing this is base two, and knowing your know, rules A, B, and C, which I have already forgotten, but I'm, the first thing I need to be concerned about is um, how do we figure this out? So you have to start with the bits that are already known to you and then figure out which one will give you the most information. So, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to start with T2. So the way I'm going to do this is to say because T2 is a 1, then we also know, you know some expression is going to be a 1. Now, if you're thinking, but I have totally forgotten how T of something is derived, what should I do? Just look it up, because it's a part of the question. So now, just look it up, you know, rule C, okay, right here, it, rule C says you know, it is the negation of XI and YI, or the negation of QI and TI. Okay, all right, so I'm just gonna plug in. So in this case, I know this is the negation of X1 and Y1, or the negation of Q1 and T1. Okay, so 
this is an occasion right there. All right, so do we have any questions about this part here? And this is based on which rule? I think it's C. So. Can you say that is a one, Okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, let, let me do this step by step, okay? Because the whole point is we need to do this step by step, okay? So we start with something that we know already, okay? You are given that T2 is a one, okay? That's given to you. You're also given that T2 is the negation of X1 and Y1 or the negation of Q1 and T1 because I gave you those rules at the very beginning and this is rule number C. This is given to you, so I am not even requiring you to remember anything at this point. Is that okay? So now what do we do? What, what can we deduce at this point? with the bits that are given to you, okay? So can, can we place any constraints at this point and say, oh, we, we know that is not going to work? Yes? That's right, but okay, so and y1 is a zero, okay? Now, why is that important? Why is Y1 being a zero important here? Because I need to end up with a one here, right? I need to end up with a one with the or, which means at least one side has to be true. Does that make sense? Hmm? No, it doesn't even matter what it is. Because X1, because Y1 is a zero already, this is a conjunction. What happens to the entire conjunction when one side is a zero already? The whole thing, the conjunction is going to be a zero. So that means I know which side of the disjunction is giving me the one. So now I can say, therefore, we know that not Q1, T1 is a one. Does that make sense? Okay, there's, there's nothing new introduced here. This is reasoning, okay? Are we okay so far? Is everybody convinced that because Y1 is a zero, this whole thing has to be zero, but because the OR has to be a one, then the right-hand side of the OR has to be a one. Is that okay? All right, so then we can say, because not Q1, T1 is a one, therefore, in this case, there's no particular rule to quote because it, this is a direct deduction of this. So how can I make the conjunction between the negation of Q1 and T1 to be a one? What has to happen? Yep, Q1 has to be a zero and T1 has to be a one. Does that make sense? That's the only way, okay? This is the only way to make the negation of Q1 and T1 to be a one. Now remember, negation applies to whatever is immediately following it. So that means this negation applies to Q1 only. It does not apply to the conjunction between Q1 and T1 which also means you know, if I were to draw your right parentheses around it, that's how I would write the parentheses. Are we doing okay so far? Yes, no, maybe, all right. Maybe not yet, okay? I'm just hoping that you know, for those people who are not quite sure yet, it is just a not yet, okay? Eventually you'll get it, yes. Well, you can just say, you, you can just kind of leave out, you, know, you can leave out this part here because you know, we already know it's a one, but we still have to mention that Q1 is a zero. Okay, all right, so if that is the case, I have to set it down because I have to use a two-hand thing to do this. So at this point, we know that is a zero. So we put a zero here, 
okay? And I'm going to put a block here just so that I can remind myself what I have figured out. Okay, so it's good for me to for grading from the grading perspective, because otherwise I may not, you know, see your actual answer, you know, kind of sprinkled within the reasoning. Okay, so now what can I do? There are quite a few things I can do. Yes. E1 is A. Yep, you're right. Okay. So now we say because Q1 is a 0 and T1 is a 1. And, okay, I cannot remember which rule, but we need to quote it. So which rule are you using? B. Okay, very good. And because of rule B, therefore, we know that D1 is a 1. Is that okay? Is everybody kind of getting the hang of this? Like what, what each step needs to do? Okay, all right. The most important part you know, of what you should be capturing is how to do the reasoning, okay? I would definitely not try to memorize this entire sequence because your question is unlikely to be involving the same sequence. But the, rash, the, the reasoning, what I use to, be, to serve as constraints, you know, what, how I'm limiting the choices that I have, and how I'm deducing which side has to be a 1, which, I, which side has to be a 0, that is the important part. Okay? All right, so now we have figured out one more new thing, which is this one here. So I'm going to do the same thing, get rid of the question mark over here. Ah, okay. So we got rid of too much stuff. Okay, let me see if I can just erase the question mark. There we go. So that we know is a one. Okay, very good. And can we make anything, can we, can we say anything about X1 at this point? Now that we know what Q1 is, and we already know what Y1 is to begin with. So what is X1? X1 has to be zero. Okay. <laughs> okay, so why is it zero? Because <clears throat> Q1 is the exclusive or between X1 and Y1. We know that Y1 is a zero. We know that Q1 is a zero. So the question is, what exclusive or with zero would give you a zero? It would be zero, okay? So now we go back here, and then we make another deduction. We say that because of rule, was it A or B? A. So because of rule A, and we know that at this point Y1 is a zero, we also know that Q1 is a zero. Therefore, at this point, we know X1 is a zero. Put a square around it, because this is something, this is a new discovery we just found out, okay? So now we go back here, and get rid of this, and turn it into a zero. I'm done with column one. Any questions? How much time do we have with time? I'm gonna say should be enough. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it, it will take me more time because I have to verbally explain everything. And trust me, I did not memorize these answers. Okay, you know, there's, I, I have a really, really bad short-term memory. You know, if I, even if I wanted to, I cannot remember. I mean, why did I flip back to the first page to, to look at the, those three rules? Because I cannot remember which one is which one. That's how bad my short-term memory is. That's also why you're allowed to have you know, any notes, paper, or books you know, with you because you know, I cannot take a test without you know, some material to help me remember something. So, all right, so now what do we do with column zero? So what are we gonna use as clues? There are a few things we can do, right? Uh, we can do something right away with T0, right? So, so can someone tell me how we can figure out the value of T0? Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is correct. Uh, 
All right. Thank you. So that's very good reasoning there. So the most important part is, you know, <clears throat> the format is important, okay, because you know, I need to understand why or how you get to the answer. Okay, so we only got one, two unknowns now. It's, it's like, can we really figure out the unknown of both X and Y at this point? The question is, how? What reasoning are you going to say? Okay, because you can just say, I'm guessing that X zero is a zero and y, y zero is a one, and guess what? It works out. That is not reasoning, okay? That is just dumb luck. Nope, 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 nope. No, because they can be flipped. There's, there's one more thing that is necessary. Go ahead. T1. <laughs> okay, okay. So that's a good direction. Go ahead. Yep. That's right. Okay, so I'm going to write it out here. You, you're absolutely correct, but you know, I'm going to write it out. Okay, so now we say, okay, I'm going to put a border around the whole thing. So we say because of rule C, okay, rule C is super helpful, okay, because you know, whether it's a one or a zero, it puts a lot of constraints on the other ones. Okay, so that's why it is usually good to start with something like that, okay? In the addition, start use the carry bits. In the subtraction, use the borrow bits because they carry a lot of information. Knowing whether it's a one or a zero, put a lot of constraints on all the other bits. Okay, so I'm going to say because of rule C, and we also know at this point T1 is a one, which means the negation of X zero, Y zero, or the negation of Q0, T0 also has to be a 1 because that, that's the definition, right? And then we can say, and we also know that at this point, Q0 is a 1, and we also know that T0 is a 1 as well. Therefore, okay, we know that the negation of X0, Y0 has to be a 1. So I'm going to break up the two stages. This is the first stage. The first stage simply means, you know, okay, we know this or has to be a one. We know the right-hand side of the or has to be a zero because we have those bits already figured out. So the only way for the or to be a one is the left-hand side of the or to be a one. And that's why I write it down here. The left-hand side, the entire expression has to be a one. Then in the next stage, then I say because the negation of x0 and y0 has to be a 1, therefore x0 has to be a 0 and y0 has to be a 1. So now I have the whole thing resolved, but I'm going to update all of that. There we go. <clears throat> so we put a 0 here and a 1 here. And then we put blocks around the new discoveries like that, and we are done. Yes? Hmm? Okay, so if it is one zero, then the negation of the one gives you a zero already. It doesn't work. Yep, so you have to go by <coughs> the Boolean expression if this Boolean expression has to be a one, then we need each side of the conjunction to be a one. So Y zero has to be a one. The negation of X zero has to be a one. But if the negation of X zero is a one, then X zero has to be a zero. Yes? Would you get more found if you had put those two steps, those last two steps in the No, no, it wouldn't, yeah. I would give you full score, but you know, but for explanation to the whole class, I prefer to break it up into two steps. Okay. Because and yeah, go ahead. What if we don't write out the equation for uh, taking each term? Uh, for like in uh, the second to last step, we wrote out like t one equals one equals not x zero and y zero. Mm. Skip that. 
I wouldn't skip that here because this you this information is used conjunction in conjunction with the rest of the entire line in order to deduce this. So I wouldn't miss that. I wouldn't. Because of C, so you, just like that. Yeah, so if you just kept that, but not. Oh, yeah, this is perfectly correct as an answer. That's why I put labels next to those definitions, is for you guys to quote it. Okay. Yeah, okay, so I misunderstood your question earlier. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yep, that's the whole point. So this way, that's why they are labeled so that you don't have to write the entire thing. You just quote the label. And that's also why in, in the example here, in the, uh, in the format example, that's why I only refer to A, B, C, D, E, F. You know, I mean, there are more rules than there are you know, in your case. But that's the format. You know, I just need to know which definition did you use in order to come to that conclusion. So I, I try my best to make it easier for on you guys you know, so that you don't have to waste your time to rewrite things and you can focus on just the logic of how you solve the problem. Part of the rubric is uh, the, sorry, not the style, the order of reasoning. Yes. So what if we had done this kind of in reverse? Like five as five long months. as it is, as long as it makes sense. So I'm not going, I'm not strictly saying that you have to follow this order, but your order has to be logical. Because what usually happens, or what sometimes happens, is some people can guess and go like, I'm just going to plug in different values until it works. So I call that the infinite monkey approach. And it does work, given enough time. And those people would, just, would, would then backward you know, explain, oh, because this works, it works. right? And things were you know, in the wrong order. So I need the reasoning to be in the correct order so that I can see that, okay, you are not just guessing the answer, you actually know how to derive the answer using the definitions. Mm -hmm, sure. All right, so is this important? Okay, yes, go ahead. Let me answer your question first. I was wondering if we could kind of show the blue map, kind of show how we got certain numbers. Okay, can you give me a specific place to start? So like if you wanted to explore C2, you would, okay. uh, you would literally just go through the C definitions? Okay. T2 is given, so there's no explaining needed. Well, I know, but the X and Y uh -huh. are, um, actually, Y1 is given, but X, X1 isn't given, so to like find X1, mm -hmm. uh, you I don't need the full explanation. Whatever is on the whiteboard right now is sufficient. So yep. if we found it that way, would that still work? Say it one more time. Uh, if we found it that way, or is that how, or is that how we deducted it? Would that still work? So deduction is different from verification. So with verification, it's called the thousand monkey approach or infinite monkey approach. Basically, every monkey tries a different way of plugging in the values. And then the one monkey that got all the values working out in the end has the right answer. But that is not deduction. That's really just your know, exhaustive search you know, for the answer, which is not what I'm looking for. So you have to use reasoning in this case to try to figure out the answer. Is that Shakespearean monkey? Huh? Is that Shakespearean monkey? <laughs> no, this is actual deduction, right? This is the smart monkey approach, the, the one monkey approach. Yeah, that's where I got that phrase from, yes. <laughs> Which, by the way, okay, yeah, when we get to um, the complexity of algorithms, not in this class, in some other classes, you know, the MP completeness and stuff like that, th that particular concept will actually kick in and become you know, important. There are certain things where you don't have a shortcut like this to get to the answer, you really have to try every single possibility and find out which one works best. It's called MP completeness. The, sales, the traveling salesman problem is a classic problem that falls into that category, but that's completely out of the <clears throat> scope of this class. So I've just kind of mentioned the name. You guys can look it up if you want to, but you know, in this, in this particular case, deduction should work. Yes? Um, 
No, that won't, none of those algorithms will solve the problem of the traveling salesman problem. But I'm going to leave, I, I, I will not talk about that. <laughs> this is the wrong class to talk about it. All right, so are we okay with this question? And why do you think I want you guys to do something like this instead of just asking, okay, if I give you all the bits of X and all the bits of Y, can you figure out the, all the other bits, which is the forward derivation? Why do you think this is important? Yep. Huh? No, this is not how the computer does it. No, not, no, no. This is the kind of practice that you need to have a chance to land a job. Did you guys read my announcement? The, the chat GPT one? ChatGPT could not solve this, which is extremely ironic because this is just hard logic. This is extremely mechanical. <clears throat> and yet, you know, the, the computer, you know, ChatGPT cannot solve this because it is a LLM. It's a large language model. Everything is just word-based. It's just calculated the probability of, hmm, based on all of these words before, I think that word should be the next. It doesn't really understand hard logic. It doesn't understand the actual meaning of a conjunction, a disjunction, exclusive or, and so on. Yep. Nope, no, it, it didn't help. I mean, you know, obviously they tried that already. So, um, nope, I don't think it helped. So if they find your video from YouTube and they see it, it, wouldn't, it would not help because it, it simply does not understand logic. It understands the words. It understands the probability of the patterns, but it doesn't really understand the concept. So, all right. So moving on to question number two. Um, Consider a 64-bit borrow look-ahead subtractor to compute x minus y. T64, a T40 is expressed as a disjunction of a single G bit and many disjunctions. Note that the symbol and, okay, the, the wedge symbol is the same as you know the C plus you know, and and, which is logical and, and so on and so forth. I'm just giving you, you know, I mean this is a repetition, okay? It's actually in the earlier parts of the exam already. For 10%, how many conjunctions are in the disjunction that computes T of 40? Explain your answer. Reference any definition that helps you figure this out, figure out, that help you figure out this answer. Okay, so what are you gonna do? First thing, okay, what do you do? After you have read this portion of the question. Yes? Okay, very good. Okay, so um, where do we find that definition? Binary subtraction module. Very good. Okay, so what does it look like? So this for this one, you know, there's not enough space here to really you know, write down all the answers. Um, okay, so we we'll go ahead and let me switch to the last open note here. All right, so can someone remember what it looks like? Okay, I think I can, I can, I can try my best, okay? So I think it starts with a big OR, where I goes from zero to N, and then G of I, okay? And a big AND over here, where J goes from I plus one to N, and those are the P terms, like so. And then, uh, or, okay, so if I need extra parentheses, it would look like that. And then the big N on this side, um, and I think there's a K, or in this case, is it a subtraction or a addition? I cannot remember. Yeah, let me, let me double check, because, you know, this is how short-term my memory is. This is, I wrote this question, okay, and I cannot remember from like 15 seconds ago. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> so now we go back here. Okay, it is a T naught, and the big end of I goes from zero to N, all the P's, I believe. 
There we go. All right. All right. So I hope you recognize this, and I hope you know where to find it. Okay, because if the answer of any of the two questions earlier, like you know, where to find this or what it is, is a I have no idea, I would be very concerned. Okay, I'm just going to be blue, brutally honest and say I would be extremely concerned when people say I have no idea what that is. Okay, so this is T of I plus one, by the way. Okay, how does this help us answer the question? What was the question again? To figure out T of 40, right? Okay. So since we're trying to figure out T of 40, what do you think N is? Okay, I, okay, this is my bad. It's not I plus 1. It is N here. There we go. Okay. So we're trying to figure out T of 40. What is N? 39. Very good. Okay. So we just plug in 39 wherever N is. So we know this is 39, this is 39, and this is 39 as well. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to focus on one little part at a time. Okay. So what do you think this part need in terms of the number of AND gates? One single AND gate over here. Because remember, in theory, an AND gate can have, as, can have as many input pins as we need it to have. Okay, so that is the trick of why the entire right-hand side of the plus, which is the OR, is just one AND gate, it, which it, it has like, what, 41 inputs in this case, but it's one single gate. Okay, so that means, huh, okay, so that means for each one of these terms, it's just an AND gate. I don't really have to deal with whatever is the AND expanding to, because you know, as whatever it expands to, one AND gate, not a problem. So our only concern is how many ORs or how many terms are we ORing, because each term that we are ORing requires one AND gate. So can someone tell me how many things are we ORing? There are exactly 40 things that we're ORing, of those things, one is not an AND, right? Because when I equals to 39, then we don't have an AND gate required because it would just be G of 39 by itself with nobody else to AND with. So that means on this side, okay, this side here, it's going to give us exactly 39 AND gates. So that means you know, together we need 40 AND gates. All right. This is a pretty long way of figuring, figuring out the answer. What do you think is a shorter way to figure this out? Which is not entirely analytical, but I will take it as a correct answer as well. It's based on, yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, but even that is a little bit, you know, you need to know this thing here. So is there a way that you can answer the question without having to reference this monster, you know, formula? Yep. But how do you know there are 39 terms? Hmm? Okay, you guys are, you're still looking at this whole thing, you know, it's because we worked out K1, K2, and K3, right? So from the observation of K3, how many AND gates does it have? Three. How many AND gates does K2 have? Two. How many AND gates K1 has? One. So you just go like, well, based on that observation, the pattern suggests that you know, K of you know, 40 is going to have 40 AND gates. But then, hold on a second here. This is all about subtraction. What is the main difference between addition and subtraction when it comes to, sorry, go ahead. Okay, so the difference is how P and G are defined. Okay, can someone tell me the, my, the really subtle difference of how P and G are defined? Yeah, go ahead. For subtraction, yep. And none of that affects this one here. 
because by the time we get here, we already have all the P and the Gs computed. That little one extra and that we need to put in front of the X to compute the P and the G does not affect the number of AND gates. Is that okay? Yes? Nope, nope. Um, let me see how the question was asked. <laughs> oh, okay, there we go. Switch to the document. All right, so the question is asking, how many conjunctions are in the disjunction? So it is specifically asking about the, the disjunction that computes your T of 40. So because you know, the G terms are subterms within each term inside the disjunction, so it doesn't count in that case. Yeah, it, it, it belongs to a different stage you know, in terms of the gates. All right, so for 10%, we, the 40, 40 is the correct answer for the 10%, yes? So, what exactly is the qualifier as the whole 10 uh, What I just wrote, you know, just kind of, you have to kind of explain the answer. So, if you just wrote that, like, because of prior knowledge, you kind of have to explain to me what prior knowledge you're referencing. So, if you say, because K1 needs one AND gate, K2 needs two, K3 needs three, and the difference between addition and subtraction has nothing to do with how the K or the T terms are computed, how it's structured. And then you just say, okay, by the, by, by the pattern, you know, by the pattern that I'm observing, um, T of 40 is gonna need 40 gates, I will count it as 10%. Yep. But you need, you need to give me some kind of reasoning. Why do you think it is 40? Yep. All right, so that's uh, part one, part two. One of, the, one of these conjunctions has exactly five terms. In other words, we have, we have one particular AND gate that has exactly five input. Figure out and express this conjunction term and, express and ex explain your reasoning. Quote any definition, blah, blah, blah. And as an example, you know, P0, P1, G2 is a conjunction that has three terms. Okay, so I'm looking for something that has exactly five terms. Okay, a conjunction that has five terms. So how do I figure out which term has exactly five terms when I'm in the attempt to compute T of 40? Okay, so we get back to here. So you look at this whole thing and go like, okay, we can identify the AND gates, right? You know, uh, this part here is one gigantic AND gate. I don't think that's a five input AND gate, right? Okay, so the five input AND gate has to be somewhere generated from here. So now you have to ask, okay, so the G1, the G of I is <clears throat> one input already. I need the big AND to contribute exactly four terms. So how do I figure out you know, which one, uh, which term you know, generates that? Okay, so how, how do you do that? We know the AND value of the J is 39. Okay, that's an awful, Really bad penmanship there. Okay, so I'm fixing my own penmanship. So we know we're ending with 39, and we need exactly four of those you know, P of J terms. So how do we figure out the other three P of Js? We know the last one is going to be P of 39. How many fingers do you have? We got enough fingers. Okay, that's the whole point. We got enough fingers. We can we can count backwards to do this, okay? So we can say P of 39, P of 38, P of 37, P of 36, aha! Four of those you know, P terms plus the G term that is outside of it. But which G term is outside of it? So if we need J to start with 36, what is I? 35, yep. Now, I did not quite write down the explanation, you know, the actual reasoning, but that's what you need to write down, okay? Maybe not in full sentences, just kind of mention how you do the deduction, okay? 
So this is the answer, okay? This is the answer that's worth 40%. Now, I did not, once again, I did not write down the rationale or the actual reasoning, but, you know, I'm pretty sure you can go to the recording of today's lecture, go to the closed captioning part, and just copy and paste what I said. You guys are savvy. I know you guys are savvy. You guys play video games that I cannot even imagine playing. So I know you guys are smart. You can figure this out. <clears throat> yes? Mm -hmm. So you're not quite understanding what the question is asking. Okay. That one, I'm not sure. You can always ask me during the exam that you're not, you don't know what the question is asking, and I can help you understand what it is asking. So, okay, the question asks, one of these conjunctions. Okay, so let's, let's work this out. <clears throat> so the question is, what, what is these conjunctions re referencing? from the previous part, right? So one of these conjunctions has exactly five terms. What, what does it mean when, when a conjunction has exactly five terms? Blah and blah and blah and blah and blah, right? And there's only one of the conjunctions that has exactly five terms. So does that help? Yeah, but that's exactly what I did um, <clears throat> in the verbal explanation. Now, I cannot you know, recall my exact you know, explanation, okay? But the point is, each one of these terms here, okay, I'm using my hovering to kind of highlight which part. So we know these has one conjunction. There's one implicit conjunction here. That's just a notation. So that means whatever this big and is contributing is the rest. So in the case that we need five, that means this is counting as one. This part has to contribute five. And because the loop is ending with I, uh, J equaling to 39, we know J has to start with 36. And because we know J has to start with 36 and J is I plus one, then we know the I has to be 35. So why is it not Huh? because it is a loop. This big N notation is implicitly a loop. It says you know, J starts with the value of I plus one, and as long as J is less than or equal to 39, keep going in the loop. And for each, after each iteration, we add one to J, and until J is greater than 39, then we exit the loop. So we know the last value, the value of the last iteration has J being exactly 39, which means the previous one has J being exactly 38, and then the one before that has J being exactly 37, and then 36. Huh? What is the correlation like the, the J number and the number of terms? Okay, so we know G of I is one of the terms already, so that means you know, this part has to contribute exactly four terms. We know that you know, those four terms has to terminate with P39. So what other terms do we need? P38, P37, P36. Because that's how the loop works. No, it's not P36 gives us four terms. It is when J starts with 36, then we have exactly four terms. Okay, because this is a loop, okay? So let me see if I can explain it like a loop. So for int i equals to x, okay? i is less than or equal to 39. I know that's not how you write less than or equal to, but bear with me, okay? You know, let's not be picky about these things. This is petty stuff, okay? And I just have something here, okay? So the question is, if I give you a loop like this, and I say I want to do whatever the block is, 
exactly four times. Can you figure out where X should start? That is the question. It's the same question here. Yeah. Yep. That's how the big N, the big OR, the sigma, they all work the same way. You're controlling the index where each item that you are ending, ORing, or adding depends on the index. Right. Yep. Oh, so you're saying, okay, I got it now. It's, it's basically just whatever the starting term is, compounding that based on like actual. It's, it's 39. Minus x plus one. That's the number of iterations that you're going to go through. Four in this case. Yep. Okay. All right. So, aren't we glad that we are going over this particular exam? <laughs> All right. So we got two done. Okay. So we got part one, part two. Uh, for part three, for twenty percent. List all the a, uh, x and y bits that contribute to this conjunction. So the question is, okay, this is reading comprehension. What is this referring to? What do you think it's referring to? Which conjunction am I referring to? Go ahead. The one that has five terms, okay. So that means if this conjunction is referring to uh, g of 35, p of 36, P of 37, P of 38, and P of 39. I know my penmanship is awful, but you guys get the idea. Okay, so this conjunction is, refer is reference that, referencing that. So now we have to figure out, okay, what X and Y terms do we need to get these things, you know, so that they are known. So what do you think? How, how are the bits computed? How is G of 35 computed? How is P of 39 computed? The negation of X, which X? X of, no. Okay, let's, let's focus on one at a time. Okay, let's just look at G of 35. I don't even care about what operator, I just need to know which x and which y I will need to compute g of 35. Yep. So this depends on x35 and y35. Okay. So knowing this, okay, how do you answer the question then? And I said that you, instead of having to spell out everything, you can use two. So this way you don't have to spell out every single term in between. So what do we need to write as the answer? X35 to X39, and then Y35 to Y39. That would be the answer. So I'm really checking whether you know how to compute or the dependency, not, not even how to compute, the dependency of the G terms and the P terms on the X and the Y terms. Okay, so that's done. Okay. Um, number four, among all the bits listed in the answer of part A, what is part A? Oh, right, right, okay, so this is part A. So. Um, what is the minimum number of these bits that must have a value of 1 to make T of 40 a 1? Okay, so this is very specific. I'm referencing all these bits here. Okay, oh, oops, take, take it back. I'm referencing all of these bits here. My focus is th just this particular, particular conjunction. I'm asking what is the minimum number of you know, uh, those bits to be 1s in order for T40 to be a one. Yes? No, but that is not true, but that's not true, but you know, that's also not the, the direction of the answer. Okay, 
So let's 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 try to figure this out. Okay. So how do I make the the entire conjunction a one? All of them have to be ones. Okay. Very good. So now we look at each individual one and ask, um, how many of the bits do I need to be a one to make P39 a one? The answer is zero. Because how is P of 39 defined in the subtraction? Not x39 or y39 in this case, right? So if both x39 and y39 are zeros, is that disjunction a one? Yeah. So that means I don't need anything to be a one for this to be a one. I don't need anything. I don't need anything. I don't need anything. What about the G term? How is G35 defined? Exactly. And Y39. Uh, 35, sorry. So there's a conjunction. One side is not negated. So that means that non-negated non -negated term in the conjunction has to be a 1. So that means the answer to question number 4 is just 1. To be more specific, X Oh, not x. Y35 has to be a 1. Yes. Yep. It's only specific to this one. So if you have that question in the test, you, know, you can come and ask me, are we talking specifically, specifically about the conjunction in the earlier parts of the question? Yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep, just that one. Yep. Go ahead. Explain your answer. So you do have the answer explain it. So you have to so the way to explain this is for all the P terms because you know um, the X the Y because it's one is a disjunction. And two, the x is negated. So that means you know, if both x and y are zeros, you still end up with the p term being a 1. But the g term is different because it's a conjunction. And with a conjunction, you need both sides to be a 1 for the conjunction itself to be a 1. But since one side is not negated, the non-negated side, which is the y of 35, has to be a 1. So you, you, I mean, you don't have to be as wordy as what, what I just said. But you need to you use the same kind of reasoning to explain it. Is that okay? I'm trying to look into your thought process, you know, not just the final answer, but because I want to know how you come up with the answer. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay, looks like uh, half the class is starting to poop out. <laughs> uh, number five. Among all the bits you know, listed in the answer of part A, what is the maximum number of these bits that can have a value of zero to make T40 a one? So this is kind of like the flip side of the whole thing. So this time I want the maximum number of these bits to be zeros. Yep. <laughs> because all of the other bits, they can all be zeros. And you can use the same explanation as you know, the previous part. All right. So are we still doing okay? What is the time? 36. Eh, I think we still we can go through at least two more questions. Yep. Yep, because G of I in the subtraction is the negation of XI and YI. Yep. So knowing these definitions is important, and that's why I've been telling you guys to write in your own notes, okay, at a corner, you know, all the definitions that you encounter, because that is what you need to know to answer these questions. Yes? Sorry? Uh, we can do it now. I suppose you guys need a break, short break at least, okay, so we can do that. Um, let's see. 
Um, where is that screen? Oh, okay, it's this one. Go to All right, so today is the 13th. It's this one, unhide it. The access code is exam one, all lowercase. Not really surprising. Here we go. All right. So exam one, all lowercase, with a numeric one is the access code. And we do have a lab today. I made one just for you guys. I didn't have it last semester, but this semester I decided, hmm, I think you guys can use some practice. So I made one. I actually have to write a Node.js script to get the quiz because, you know, because Canvas sucks. <laughs> it doesn't have the operators that I want. It doesn't have mod. It does not have Boolean operators, so I have to use all of the other math operators to emulate the Boolean operators. And I'm not going to hand write everything because it's going to be super long, so I just wrote a script to do it for me. I just copied and pasted. <laughs> all right, so I'm not sure about question number three. I'm going to skip question number three to question number four because question number four is actually the fun one. Yes. Oh, okay, well, we can tell the rest of the class. It's due in one minute. Is, does anyone need more time? Nope, okay. There might be a few people who are not here. Yep, okay. All right, so let's start on question number four. So let's see, where is my, okay, there you go. All right, question number four is kind of fun. It's a subtraction in base six. So we are doing hand subtraction in base six. So the first part asks, what is the decimal representation of the value represented by the Y row in this case? So what do you think Y row is? It's the 154, but what value is represented by 154 in base six? So 154 in base six is, what is that in base 10? But how do we know that? Okay, so once again, you know, you need to spell out the expression. Go ahead. Okay, so send me an email. Yep. All right, so how do we know that? How do we expand this expression? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is what. So this is how I would do it, you know. Because you know, what each digit is doing is is telling us the quantity of the power of six corresponding to that position. Okay. So once we get this, we have thirty six plus thirty plus four, which is exactly. 70, okay? So that's for 10%, okay? Just a little bit of points here. All right, so number two, <clears throat> figure out the, rela the related definitions. All right, so we'll do it one step at a time. What is R of U, W? I'm specifically choosing two things that are not X, Y, so it's not confusing. How is that going to be defined in base six? Now remember, this is subtraction. So we are looking at the single digit difference in a subtraction. It is not in the module, but we talked about it in the class. So that was talked about in the, in the, in the, in the lecture itself. Mm -hmm. So U minus W, the whole thing, mod six. That'll work. 
but if you are concerned about you know, the mod of a negative number, you can always add six within the parentheses first so that you don't have to deal with you know, the, the concept of what is a negative number mod six. Okay, so, but that's optional. This will give you the correct result. Okay, what about the next one? What about the B of UW? The borrow, okay? So under what condition are we going to borrow when we are subtracting W from U? Mm, that sounds a lot more complicated than it needs to be. What about this? Yep. Okay, so that will work. So in the case there are multiple ways to express the same thing, you can use any of those ways, okay? But I'm just gonna use the one that, to me, makes the most sense. All right? So this is important because without knowing this, we cannot compute the rest. So now we say, how is Q of I defined in this context? It's the same as in a binary version, except your, your R and B are defined differently, but it's the same relationship. So Q of I is defined as what? R of, yep. R of, there's no negation, there's no conjunction because we're dealing with base six, okay? So negation, conjunction, and disjunction, they only work when we're dealing with base two. This is base six. So you have to go back to the actual definition of R and B in the much more conventional way. All right, the next one is D. D is easy too. So D is just the R of what? QITI, very good, all right. So we are connecting here. What is T of I plus one? We, we defined B already, so we can reference B. Okay. All right, yep, there you go. All right, so as I said, you know, this portion, especially with how we define R and B, is not in the module. It was discussed in the lecture. So you need to go back to the lecture to kind of watch that part again if you missed it. I did put a, a short description at the end of each date of the lecture. So this is you know, belonging to what binary subtraction. So look for binary subtraction in the video, and you will find it. All right. So next, okay, part three. So we got this done. Part three is copy the multi-digit subtraction table to your answer sheet and figure out the the rows. So what is row Q? What is row T? And what is row D? Okay. So I'm just going to do it in place here. Um, okay, so four, five, three, four, five, two, minus one, five, four, and this is X, Y, this is Q, so we'll, we'll figure out Q first. So two minus four in base six is what? Okay, look, look at the, uh, the, the R definition here, okay? So we are doing the subtraction and then the mod six. That's actually not easy, okay, because now we have to say, what is negative two mod six? What is negative mod six? Do you remember the congruent modulo thing? The wheel thing, right? So which number on that dial is gonna share the same position as negative two? We got zero here, negative one, and this is negative two, which is, huh? Four. Okay, four is the correct answer. Okay, so this is four. The other way to look at this, okay, is to think, okay, two is less than four, I cannot do this subtraction, I have to borrow. But what, when, what are you borrowing from the next column? What, you're borrowing a quantity of six. So that means you end up with two plus six, which is an eight, eight minus four is a four. But then you also have to remember that you have now a borrow. And this one, you can assume you know, T0 is a zero. So four minus zero is a four. I think that one is pretty easy to figure out. All right, so now we have five minus five is a zero. Okay, I think that's pretty easy. Zero minus one, same thing. Zero is less than one. I cannot do this subtraction. I need to borrow six from the next column. 
So that means the zero becomes a six, six minus one is a five, but I have to remember that I borrowed, okay? Four minus one, ah, okay, that's an easy one. Three minus one, which is also an easy one. So there's no over or borrow as t of three. Is that okay? So, so you can approach this using the very mechanical way based on how uh, B, Q, uh, B, R are defined and based on all of these equations. But you can also just look at this from the arithmetic perspective of if the minimum is less than the subtrahend, then we borrow from the column on the right hand, on the left hand side, which means in basics, we're borrowing a quantity of six and then you do the subtraction. All right, so we got that done. So in, in part four, what is the decimal representation of the value represented by the Q row? So in this case, the Q row, which is this one here, is 306 in base six. So that would be three times six to the power of two plus zero times six to the power of one plus four times six to the power of zero. So then we have, what, 3096 here plus the four, and that would be 100 in base 10. Yep. I do not assume because <laughs> that's okay, that's okay, but it's important to kind of remember, you know, all those little things, right? Because decimo means base 10 already. Yep, it's okay, you know, I, I, you know, it's easy to miss those things, but that means when you're reading the question, you have to read it carefully because it has all the information, it's just that you have to kind of pick out all those information. But if you do have a question about that, you know, I would, I would answer that too. Uh, we are running out of time. Um, question number three does not fully relate to this class here you know, because we never really talked about the VS and the VU of something, so it doesn't really relate. But yes, go ahead. So, sorry, I have a question before. Uh, three times six squared is 108. You are right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, 108 plus four is a 112, thank you. Okay, I always say that you know, in my own class, if I were a student in my own class, I would be a B student at best <laughs> because I cannot do arithmetic. And I make stupid mistakes, yeah, the stupidest mistakes, I make those. Um, yes, but thank you, very good. <laughs> All right, so we do have a lab today because as I said, you know, I've made a lab just for you guys as a practice, okay, you guys need to practice this, okay? If you're thinking this one is challenging, you know, that means, you know, you might need some, you, you might need some practice. So I wanna show you the uh, access code to the lab first, and then we'll head out to the lab. So let me unhide it first. <clears throat> and there are 12 questions. And I did not set up a access code, I forgot. So now, you know, you just go to the lab and do it. <laughs> um, I cannot remember. I can, I can try to find it. I usually mechanically generate a key because there's, there's a unique question set for each student. <laughs> so I probably have a key for that. So if I can find it, I'll, I'll post it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry? Okay, let me let me stop the recording.